Okay, so welcome to the course. So this course will be about Erlang. Erlang, which is a multi-agent system developed by Ericsson in Sweden since around 1990. It's old system. It's as about as old same age as Java. Okay, but it's really good for multi-agent and concurrent programming. So I'm going to tell you all about Erlang. So you're going to have two lab sessions to practice Erlang. So Erlang is an open source system. You can download it. And so in the lab session, you will do experiments. So there'll be two labs on Erlang and two lectures on Erlang. So I'm going to start today by giving you a big overview of Erlang. I want to give you some of the properties of Erlang. So I'm going to show you what Erlang is good for. So it's very good for concurrency and for distributed systems where you have lots of message passing. I'm going to show you a real Erlang application. So you can really see the kind of application it is good for. I'm going to refresh a little bit the Erlang concepts. You will uh, normally in the previous course you have seen already kind of introduction to Erlang. But here I want to go a little bit deeper. I want to go into the programming patterns. So Erlang has a lot of tools for building systems that are robust and concurrent. And they, they are called behaviors. So a behavior is like a generic pattern. I will show you that. I will show you a generic server. So if you want to build a server in Erlang, all you have to do is do the functionality and the, the system has a tool that does everything else, the fault tolerance, the, the, the up code updating, everything. I'll talk also about supervisors. So Erlang has a mechanism for making very robust systems where you have agents that are looking at other agents, and if something goes wrong, they can fix it. This will be done, then I'll do it today and tomorrow. There are lots of documents on the internet about Erlang. So here's some two good references. So there's a very nice website called Learn You Some Erlang for Great Good. This is very pedagogical. There's also a really nice book written by two industrial guys from a company called Erlang Solutions, Designing for Scalability with Erlang OTP. So, but there's many other good books. Huh? These are just two examples. You'll find many things on the internet for Erlang. It's a system with lots and lots of uh, documentation. To start, I want to give you some numbers. I want to show you what Erlang is good for, for concurrency and message passing. So here is a graph that looks at process creation times. In Erlang, a process is what in Java would be called a thread. Huh? In Erlang, it's called a process because they do not share data. So they are kind of like operating system processes. So here you have the number of processes in the system. So the number of concurrent entities. So in Java, this would be the number of threads. In Erlang, the number of processes. You see it's logarithmic, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. These numbers come, are old numbers, they come from 2002. People don't re-measure re them all the time, but these numbers, the relative numbers was, are still the same today uh, because the computers have improved, so everything has improved, so you will, these numbers, the time for process creation will decrease, but the relationship will be the same. So here you see in red, the process creation time for airline, this process spawning, a function of the number of processes, and the time is in microseconds per process. And here in green, you see the time for Java, the Java in 2002, and in blue, you see for C sharp. Okay, so if you create 100 processes, each process creation takes, in 2002, it took several hundred microseconds. It's rather expensive because it has to build a big structure. Whereas an airline, the time up until 2,500 is less than one microsecond. After that, it becomes higher because you have to manage the memory. Okay, so but still, it's less 
than 10 microseconds for process speed, and if you have 10,000 processes. So Erlang is really a system where you can create a large number of concurrent agents, and you don't have to worry about it, basically. So that's one table of numbers. Let me talk now about the message sending times. You send messages between processes, okay? Here again, the number of processes, the horizontal axis, and the number of microseconds for sending a message. So you see an airline, airline is in red here. The time for sending a message from one process to other is around one microsecond. This was in 2002, so this is between two concurrent processes, one send and one receive the message. You can see here in blue is the time for C sharp. This was around, I guess you could say it's around uh, 30 or 40 microseconds. And in Java, uh, it starts like that, but then when the number of processes increases, the overhead really grows much higher. Okay, So you can see that airline has optimized for process creation and communication. It's really optimized for that. Okay. Now, Erlang in those days was not native code. It was running on a virtual machine, kind of like Java. So Java was running on JVM, but it also has in-time compilation. Erlang is running on a virtual machine called the Beam. Uh, so that's uh, so it's not optimized for for a matrix for floating point, but it's optimized for processes and communication. So here's an application, a use case. So this is a web server. So in Airline, there's a there were several web servers written in Airline. And this is a web server called Yaws, yet another web server. And this is also in uh, 2002. You can see here the number of processes. So this is the number of concurrent requests to the web server. So HTML requests. So you're loading the web server with a number of concurrent requests, and this is in tens, it's in tens of thousands, 10,000, 20,000, up to 90,000. And here on the uh, vertical axis is the throughput of the system in kilobytes per second, so going from 100 kilobytes to 900 kilobytes. Okay, the total aggregate throughput. Of course, if you have many processes, then they will share the total throughput. So the throughput per process is going to decrease here uh, when you increase. And so let's see what happens. So in red, you have airline. In green, you have Apache web server with a local disk. And in blue, you have Apache using NFS, network file system. So you can see that uh, Apache does quite well up until, sorry, the green, the, the green one where you use the local disk does quite well, similar performance to airline, up until 4,000 processes, and then it crashes. Because, well, what language is Apache written in? It's not written in airline. Yeah? And if you use NFS, it's a little bit slower, but it cannot handle more than 4,000 concurrent processes. That means if you overload the web server, crashes and burns. It's not so nice, huh? So let's say you have a, you're a company, you have a product, you make an ad, this is the day, and everybody wants to go to your website, and your website crashes. You've seen that maybe happen, huh? Mm -hmm. So this is what happens. Now, Erlang has a very nice, different property that you can increase very much the concurrency, and it will not crash. The performance will go down, but it will go down in a nice, Way. So the system will support a large number of concurrent processes, but uh, will not uh, will not and uh, will not crash. So if you see the red the one the early one, so here it goes up to eighty thousand. This is already twenty times more than. So I don't know what happens here. Maybe the airline system. Maybe there was a memory limitation and it could not go farther. But it was already twenty times more concurrent requests than. Uh, Apache, and you can see the performance becomes very variable. So you can see that all these processes, of course, are going to interfere 
with each other, all these concurrent processes. So the airline server will have to do some bookkeeping and management to keep all that uh, together. So you can see that the throughput can, will, will decrease. So it's extremely uh, fluctuating here. The throughput will decrease when the number of processes increases, but, uh, but it doesn't crash. Okay, that means if you are a user and you make a web request, it will work. It will, it will be slower, but it will work. Okay, so Erlang is really optimized for highly concurrent systems. Systems where you can have enormous peaks of concurrent use and it will work. So if you are building later on in your company a, an application that has that requirement, then Erlang is a good choice for implementing it. Okay. Uh, of course, Erlang is not as popular as uh, Java because it was not invented in Silicon Valley. It was invented in Sweden by Ericsson. But Ericsson is a big company. Uh, probably some of you have Ericsson phones. So Ericsson is a big telecommunications company. So they, for them, this is very important. Okay. Let me show you one more example. This is an, an ATM switch. So an ATM, ATM is a is a is a kind of a router. Uh, it's not doing IP. It's doing ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, which is basically creating circuits. So this was for uh, guaranteed performance between end to end. So not a best effort. So the AXD three eighty one is a large, high performance ATM switch for in big industrial networks, okay, covering the whole countries. So this was one of the top of the line products from Ericsson. It's not something you use in your house, it's used something by good big companies, okay? So the AXD301 was written in Erlang and with some low level code in C and Java. So you can see here the size of the beast. So release 3.2 has 1 million lines of Erlang 900,000 lines of C, C++, 13,000 lines of Java, and it uses the Erlang OTP, which is the basic library, which itself has 240,000 lines of Erlang, half a million lines of C, 15,000 lines of Java. So you can see this is a big industrial system. It took years to develop it, okay? Now, in this graph, we can see here the call throughput so it makes calls. I make a, I want to do a call from one point to another, and it will create a circuit so between the source and the destination. And the offered load, here is the offered load. So the offered load is the number of attempts. I try to make a call. So this is like for big telephone system, uh, networks. Huh? When you make a telephone call, it's actually creating a circuit between you and the person on the other side, so a connection with a guaranteed bandwidth. Huh? So you're trying to make a call. So this is the, the calls that are being tried, and this is the actual call throughput. So you can see what happens when I do more and more calls here. First, what happens is the call throughput increases linearly. That means the calls are succeeding, okay? I'm succeeding, but at some point I reach the limits of the system. The capacity of the system, 100%. All the lines are fully busy, and that means further calls will not be accepted. But still, they cause overhead, because when I try to make a call, the system has to run code to try to make the connection. So the more I do the offered load, the more the system has to work, even though the calls are not accepted. Huh? So you can see what happens here. So at some point, up to 150% offered load, it basically stays at the maximum. But then if I keep increasing the offered load up into 1,000%, so 10 times more calls than you can accept, okay? I do 10 times more, the system will have a lot of overhead in handling those rejected calls. Huh? It has to try to make the call, figure out and send messages, do all kinds of things, bookkeeping. So the, it has to do a lot of work for these rejected calls. And you can see what happens in the system. The performance 
Remember, the throughput actually goes down gradually. So this is actually very nice. Now you can see the rejected calls are very high here. And this is this little line is the extra work you have to handle all these rejected calls. So you can see the overhead, the, the throughput is going down, but it's going down in a nice, nice way, and it's not crashing. Okay. So this is a very good property. You overload the system and it handles the overload very, very well. Okay. Of course the performance will go down, but each call that is made will still be made. Okay. So for the calls that are made, it's working fine. So this is a very good uh, behavior. Okay. So this is an example of one big industrial system written in uh, airline. So this is from an article. Well, Fourfold increase in productivity and quality by a, one of the engineers, Ulf Rieger from, from Ericsson, who basically wrote a, after they made the AXD3 a one they were an article. So this was this is one of the systems that shows this advantage of a, of a system that can support concurrency very well. Okay? So that's an example also of a system written in airline. And now I want to go into detail. I want to show you one actual application to give you an idea of the kind of software that is good for doing an airline. And this is a sensor fusion framework called HERA. So let me explain what it's all about. So this application is written in the context of Internet of Things. So Internet of Things is a kind of buzzword, but what it means is that you have a lot of low power devices directly at the edge. So smartphones are part of that, but not only smartphones. Now there's people with lots of extra devices around uh, in their houses, uh, things that are connected to the internet is increasing. Okay, so this is growing exponentially. So in this graph, it compares the number of Internet of Things devices with the number of human beings on Earth. Okay, this is interesting because, for example, smartphones, usually every human has one smartphone, eh? maybe two, but that's hard. One, that means it saturates. Once you have seven billion <coughs> smartphones, it doesn't grow anymore. But Internet of Things does not have that limit. In, in fact, it's growing exponentially. And you can see here, in 2011, it was more than the number of humans, so 6.5 billion. We're assuming that on the Earth there will be 8 billion humans in 2025. So this is the exponential growth. So this is measured. So there is an, it's been measured also in the past. So there's a projection that it will be 75 billion in 2025. So this is growing exponentially. Okay? And it's by far not saturating because it's easy to have hundreds of devices for one person, okay? Because all the devices are around you in the environment. And if you look at the growth, you can see this is growing right now 13% per year. Whereas data centers, data centers, which is the cloud, uh, is growing 5% per year. So people talk a lot about data centers and cloud computing and uh, cloud is the big thing, it's still kind of in the media, but in fact, the cloud is now maturing, it's slowing down. We are, we have clouds now for 20 years, okay? Clouds were invented by Google and Amazon 20 years ago, and now we're kind of saturating, it's, it's slowing down, 5%. Still growing, but slower. Whereas Internet of Things is growing very fast, 13% per year, okay? So the question is, how do you program all those devices? You have many devices, in the, for example, in the room you can have many devices. They're all running at the same time, so they're concurrent, they're distributed. Distributed means that they are physically separate. Huh? It's not just in one machine, but they're separate, communicating through a network. And the environment is hostile. This is the real world. These are low power devices, the power can go down, the network can go down, uh, the, the, the dog can chew up the device 
and it could break, okay? So the environment is hostile. You cannot assume that they keep working. They will crash, okay? So this is an environment where actually Erlang is a good choice. And let me show you how it works. Okay, here, so I'm going to show you a, a, a software application called Hera, which does sensor fusion. Okay, sensor fusion is an important operation for Internet of Things. If I have sensors in a room, temperature, uh, sonar, okay, uh, CO2, whatever sensors, each of the sensors is given information. Uh, here, for example, gyroscope, thermometer, magnetometer, uh, giving direction, uh, boussole, uh, compass, sonar also, you have sonar sensor, GPS for position. All of the sensors are giving information. Now, that's kind of very primitive. They're all giving information on one environment. This may be in this room, okay? So sensor fusion combines all the information from multiple sensors to give a single coherent view of a real-world situation. So if there's a person walking in the room, the sensors are detecting that person, well, then, but they're separately giving data. But you somehow have to combine all that data. You see, it's not so easy. Huh? If I have two sonars, if I have a CO2, if I have temperature. So if there's more people talking in a room, the temperature goes up, the CO2 goes up. You can actually compute the number of people in a room by measuring CO2 because they're all breathing, discussing. Okay, You can compute if there's a meeting, if the discussion was very intense, the CO2 will increase faster. Okay, But you have to combine all that information. So this is what ERA does. It takes all this information coming, streams of information. So these arrows are streams of their information coming in and combines them to give one coherent view of a system. Okay? So you can see that's, that's maybe not so simple. So I will explain a little bit how ERA works. But the ERA system is written in Erlang and it's running on a set of boards called BRISC boards. So let me show you the hardware platform that Hera is running on. So this is an Internet of Things application. Huh? It's running on small boards that are in your environment. So this, these boards are called BRISC. So there's many kinds of boards uh, that you can buy for Internet of Things. Uh, Raspberry Pi is popular. There's also a thing called Arduino and so on. So these, this is running on BRISC. So the BRISC board is a low-cost board here that runs directly, airline directly. So BRISC is designed to run airline on top of a real-time low-level kernel. So that means it can run IoT on, out of the box. It has sockets. Here you can see the sockets for sensors and actuators. So here's some of the sensors you can get. So the navigation sensor here, PMON Nav, it has a sensor with uh, multiple things, an accelerometer, three-dimensional, gyroscope, magnetometer, all 3D, pressure sensor, temperature sensor, all on that one little thing. So it's all very miniaturized. Eh? These are called MEMS sensors, microelectronic miniature sensors, miniature systems. So these are actually like integrated circuits. These are very small sensors. Here's also here's a sonar. That's a sonar which gives you the distance of the closest object. So there's many of these. You can buy many of these sensors and build IoT applications, okay? So you just plug them in. So the BRISC will immediately support them. It has airline drivers for many sensors. So you buy this system, you can immediately start running, start writing IoT. You don't have to build the system. So it's much easier, for example, than Raspberry Pi, which is just a general computer. This is actually a system made for IoT. Okay, so this is the hardware platform we used for Hera. So the actual Hera architecture now. Let me show you the Hera architecture. So here you have a network of BRISC boards, one through N. In the application that was done, it was tested with, up with five boards. You can also connect a laptop to it, and they all communicate through Wi-Fi. So the Hera runs on BRISC boards networked 
using Wi-Fi, and you can connect to external computer, to internet, uh, also. So this one would also be running uh, airline and connect to that. So each of these boards runs the full HERA framework, so it's redundant, and it's a sensor fusion engine. So the technical uh, basis of this is a technique called the Kalman filter, which I'll explain in the next slide. It also has broadcast interface and sensor interface for the PMI. So the blue part here is the sensor fusion model. Okay, it stores also data and it has a communication model. So each one, each mod board does sensor fusion and it stores the data and also broadcasts the board. So this sensor data coming here, so this for example might be accelerometer or sonar. This is broadcast, so all the boards are receiving all the sensor data. Okay. So that's the architecture of it, uh, and, and each board is running the same software. Okay, so how does this, what's going on now, what is the properties of this system? It's using a technique called a Kalman filter, which you can see, which maybe in some courses you can see how it works. So a Kalman filter basically has a physical model of a system, like a person, and it measures, excel it has the person moving in 3D, for example, and it shows, you can predict the state. So it has a person moving, and the common filter will say, the person moving with this velocity in this direction, so it's predicting the state, okay? But, but it's not precise, so it's like probabilistic. It's predicting like a cloud, uh, the possible positions, so this is the one thing. So the prediction is the first part. The second part is that you measure the actual position using the sensors. So the sonar, for example, will measure the distance, or the accelerometer will measure the actual acceleration. But this data is also not so accurate. So this also gives you kind of a, a possible probabilistic thing. And then the magic trick is you, you do the intersection of the prediction and the sensor, sensor measurements. So the prediction gives you this big set of possibilities. The sensor gives you another set. You intersect them, and then you get a much smaller set. And that is the next input. So you see the common filter combines prediction with the sensor data. So that's kind of the intuition of it. And then you can... Use, it's doing matrix computations with probabilities and covariances. I'm not going to go to theory of this. So this is then doing that computation. Okay, so this is implemented on the RISC board. And it's asynchronous and dynamic. So this is typically an airline property. Asynchronous means any sensor data can arrive at any time. Sensor data is arriving. We don't know when, you know? It depends on when the sensor does its work, and they're all separate. So the sensor data, and then it's broadcast, it can arrive at any time. So this model allow, can, can take that data and use it, okay? Also, the boards can join and leave. These are boards with uh, low cost, with low power, but maybe the board crashes. Maybe the battery runs out. Happens all the time, okay? Even happens on mobile phones. Battery runs out. So these boards can join and leave at any time. So it's completely dynamic, the system. That doesn't make any problem. The boards can join and leave at any time. Also the sensors. Maybe the sensor has a problem, okay? Maybe uh, rain falls on the sensor and it doesn't work anymore or something. So the sensor leaves the system, it breaks. That's not a problem. So sensor data can come if the sensor leaves. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. So this is extremely asynchronous and dynamic. So it's not at all fixed monolithic. Yeah? It's very loose, asynchronous and dynamic. And it's also fault tolerant. That means if a board crashes, it still works. So all the boards are doing the full common computation. So that's redundant. If I have five boards, then I have five computations. 
And the condition is, as long as at least one board is actually running, the sensor fusion will work, okay? But if, if more boards are running, it might be more accurate, huh? If there's more sensor data, maybe it's more accurate. But if there's less data, then it's less accurate. But it's like the previous application. When you have stress, the performance goes down gradually, okay? So this is implemented using the airline supervision mechanism, which I'll explain later, okay? So this actually is a perfect fit for airline. And what we implemented, so what was actually implemented is something that is very uh, sophisticated. It's called an attitude and heading reference system. So it's basically modeling the movement of a person or an object in real, real time. So it has a gyroscope. So the gyroscope is doing inertial navigation. Inertial navigation means that you predict from the periphery system. So the gyroscope will tell you the orientation, 3D, and then you can say it goes here. But there's an error would accumulate. Huh? So airplanes would do this inertial navigation, but after going a certain time, you have like an error that accumulates. And in order to fix the error, you need some kind of absolute number, some number that doesn't have error, and this is where the magnetometer comes in. This is the actual direction using a compass a boussole in space. So basically the idea is to remove the error using the, the absolute information coming from the magnetometer. And then you have a rotation matrix that will update. And here you have what's called a quaternion-based common filter. So this means that there's no uh, problems of orientation. So this, is actu this means actually that uh, there's no glitches. It's actually not so easy to do rotation correctly. So this is doing it correctly. Okay, so this is being done in real time, and in fact, the GRISP-1 board that it runs on is, we're actually pushing it to the limit, okay, we're, it's maximum using it. The update frequency is 3.75 hertz, so it's like 30.0.3 seconds, a little bit less, for each iteration, for each prediction step, okay, so that's not so fast, though. But this is the current GRISP-1, so there's a GRISP-2 that will appear in a few months, which is 10 times faster. And also we are, build, we are building an improved matrix library, which will be another 10 times faster. So normally this number will go up in the future. This is the current limit, okay? So this is a very nice application, and it works in airline. And really what was really nice about this application is that it's coming from a master's thesis, okay? That was done here, last year. And basically four months full-time work by two students. And it was actually not completely uh, from scratch because there was a previous master's student that did some preliminary work with sonar. And, we, and this actually turned into a scientific publication in the ACM Sigplan International Airline Workshop. So this thing is actually known now in the airline community, and there's actually references here for the hardware. So the hardware, there's a company building these called Stritzinger in risk.org, and there's also software for, for hair, okay? So this shows you what you can do if you have a good tool. So an application like Hera, if you want to do a Raspberry Pi, would take years, but using airline and risk, it takes four months. Of course, the students are smart students as well. Huh? That helps. Huh? Okay, so that gives you some idea of a kind of application that Erlang is good for. So this kind of application, highly concurrent, fault tolerant, is very easy in Erlang, actually. Okay. Okay. Let me say talk more now about Erlang. So you're going to have two lab sessions now to learn Erlang. So let me refresh you first on the airline concepts. Actually, airline is very similar. It's very similar to the multi-agent model of this course. Of course, it's different, though. Uh, airline has its own way of doing things, okay? 
So, but the core of Erlang is pure functional. So, very similar to what we see, it has a, fu a transition function, and it's a pure, lexically scoped, higher order closure. Okay? The variables also are single assignment. So this is, uh, and this was not done by me. This is these industrial guys in uh, Sweden did this. Huh? It has pattern matching in the case and the if. Also it has receive statement for messages. So when you send the messages, you, you can get them out of the mailbox using receive. It's a symbolic language. So actually, in the, for people that have followed my course, this is very uh, familiar, okay? It has integers, floats, atom symbolic constants, it has lists, uh, it has tuples with slightly different syntax. So the lists have sort of similar syntax with commas, the tuples have this with braces. Strings are lists of ASCII codes. It has a, an extra data type, binary vectors. And this is for protocol. Computation. So Erlang is very good for building low-level protocols. So it can receive a bit vector and take out chunks of that bit vector very easy. It has notation for that. So it's a language where you can build internet protocols very easily. Okay. So that is something you will see in the lab sessions. So I'm not going to uh, say so much in this course. On that, you will see that in the lab, the next lab session. You also saw that a little bit in the previous course, 1104. But this is not very hard. If you follow this course, you will easily see Erlang. And why is it kind of like this? Well, it's actually very funny. The original Erlang implementation, it's kind of historical. The original system, the first prototype of Erlang was written in a language called Prolog, which is a logic programming symbolic language. Why did they write it in Prolog? That's kind of very weird, because Prolog is extremely high level, it was very easy. They wanted to prototype it, so they kind of fixed the syntax based on Prolog syntax, so that's why it kind of has a weird syntax, okay? There's another language now, so Erlang was developed then, in those days, but there's another language now called Elixir, which is both of them are running on the same virtual machine, the Beam. But Elixir has a syntax related that's, that's coming from Ruby. So at some point, the Erlang community realized syntax is very weird. We have to make a better syntax, okay? So they made another language called Elixir but both of them are running the same concurrent things. So they both run on the same virtual machine and they can talk to each other. But Elixir has a more traditional syntax, so it's based on Ruby, okay? So this is actually a big community now. So the, the whole airline ecosystem is actually combining these two, okay? But for this course, we're going to use Erlang, which is the original one. Huh? But if you're interested, you can also see Elixir. Okay, so a little bit about typing. So Erlang is a strongly typed language. So this is, it's actually, in that sense, very similar to Oz. It's strongly typed. That means the types are enforced by the language. Uh, you cannot break the types in the language. So many languages are like this. Huh? Java, Scheme, Haskell, Prolog. So Java is like that, because you cannot actually check out the implementation of the types. But languages like C, C++, uh, are not strongly typed because you can use casts to muck around inside. So, so Erlang is not like that. Erlang is strongly typed. And Erlang is dynamically typed, so you don't declare types, like in Java. Variables can be bound to any kind of type. Uh, in a statically typed language, you have to declare the types. Okay, now this it's actually very funny. People say that static typing is better for correctness because you can actually catch errors at compile time. Okay, if I do, if I mix the word types in the wrong ways, the compiler will see I'm not using it correctly and it catches errors. 
So people sometimes say that static type languages are more robust than dynamically typed language. This is very weird because Erlang is actually just the opposite. No? Static typing catches what I call surface errors, which means small errors because that you're not calling things in the right way. But if you have actually deep errors, errors of logic in your program, then static typing will not catch that. It turns out that Erlang programs are extremely resilient, much more resilient than Java programs, okay? They will be much more fault tolerant and robust. Uh, you saw in the previous graphs when, for example, the web server, the Erlang program is much more resilient. It can handle much more overload. And the reason is Erlang is giving you the mechanism. So we'll explain that in this course. It gives mechanisms which are called linking, it gives mechanisms called behaviors and supervisors, and these handle deep, complicated errors. So in fact, even though Erlang is dynamically typed, it's much, much more robust than most other languages. In fact, there's probably no other language which is as robust for building robust systems than Erlang, okay? Because it's really designed for that. Okay, so that's an interesting comment. So it basically means that there's really not so much difference between dynamic and statically typed. Uh, people will be religiously attached to one of the others and say, yeah, static type much better. In fact, there's not so much difference. And the proof is Erlang, which is dynamic type and, and it's robust. It's clearly robust. There are commercial products in Erlang that are extremely resilient, like the AXD. So there's no doubt about that, okay? So Erlang programs are very similar to programs in some sense than other languages. You organize them in modules. So typically a module will be like in one file, okay? So here's an example, math module, and it exports some functions. It also imports from other modules. Okay, so here's a simple module. It imports from lists the map to map slash two means map with two arguments. Okay, and it defines functions. So basically, Erlang is in some sense a functional language. Here you have an area function that takes a tuple where the first argument is a constant square and, this, and a variable. You see the variables start with uppercase. This is, like, this is like us, but in fact, the idea of variables with uppercase comes from Prolog. Okay, the Prolog language was the one that did this kind of convention. So Erlang keeps this funny convention, okay? Uh, Elixir does it differently, yeah? But in Erlang, the x is a variable, it's an argument. So a square with side x, the area is x times x. And you can have multiple clauses, and it actually chooses using pattern matching, okay? And areas of a list, you can actually do uh, higher order work things. So here, for example, I can sum the areas of, every, of a list of things using a map function. So this is actually a lambda expression. Huh? Huh? This map here, this map, fun i, area i, end. This is like a lambda. It's like an anonymous function. Huh? And so in Oz, you would write it with this dollar notation, but here in Erlang you can see with this arrow notation you can pass anonymous functions. So it's very similar to a functional language in the core, okay? So modules can import and export. So you have basically have a graph of modules, and this is similar to packages in Java, whatever. This is very standard, okay? Now uh, we're going to slowly go to things that are less standard. So Erlang, on top of functions, it has message passing. So Erlang is like two-layer. You have these functions, but actually you have Erlang processes that do message passing. So an Erlang program, uh, you have a process that's running, and you can create another process. So you have a function called spawn. Fun is like the transition function. It defines the behavior of the process. And PID is the name. 
So you can kind of compare this to port object, huh? where PID is the name, is the name like the name of the port, and fun, fun is kind of like the transition function. Uh, it's a function. So these processes are very lightweight. They're like threads. You can have thousands of them. I remember I showed you the graph, a hundred thousand, uh, or you can, and in current systems you could have hundreds of thousands or millions of these, and they are independent. They do not share. This is very important. They do not share data. That means if one process crashes, nothing else crashes. So this is super important. They do not share. You don't have pointers in Erlang. There's no, you cannot pass pointers. When process talk to each other, they will copy data always. So this is very important. Processes do not share, okay? And the process ID is a constant. It's like port object. It's the name of the port, you could say, yeah? So everything you saw in this course Erlang is some ways it's similar than this, okay? So spawn is like creating like new port object. Then you can send messages. This is using this exclamation point, bang notation. You can say send message to a process using an exclamation, PID send message. This is asynchronous, so it's very similar to send to a port. Huh? And the data is copied. So no sharing. There's no sharing, okay? So this is how you do a send. And then the way it's received, you have a receive statement, which is kind of like a case, but it receives messages. And that's inside of the, the function. You can have a receive. So let me show you the receive. So you can do send, okay? So each process, when you do spawn, it has a mailbox. So this is the error. Thing, huh? It contains all the messages received ordered list. Okay, so you can say this is kind of similar to a port object. Huh? You have a stream of messages. It's kind of similar, but it's not actually. Uh, it's actually in some ways it's different. I'll explain. So if you want to extract messages from the mailbox, you use a receive statement, and it. It removes the first message that matches. So you do pattern matching. So this you have seen. It's similar to the pattern matching with the case that we've seen. So many languages have some kind of pattern matching. So Erlang has patterns. It also has Boolean conditions called guards, and you fix it. But the, there is a major difference, though, between receive and port objects. In a port object, you always read the first message. And then the second message, and then the third one. But a receive statement will look at all the messages in the mailbox and it will pick one, the first one that matches. So if the first message does not match anything, it looks at the second message or the third one. So it can pick the third message out of the mailbox. So it's really like a mailbox. So huh? if I have a bunch of letters in a mailbox, I can take any one out. So that's a big difference with port objects. Okay, so that actually is a special design decision from Erlang that the receive can pick messages out of order. That's actually very useful. So this is a more uh, robust way of doing things than port objects, actually. Okay, so summarizing it, so you have send, which is like that, uh -huh. PID send message, and then you have receive, the message patterns and actions. You can also do a timeout. So the receive can also have a time that it waits a certain time. If it receives no messages, it does some kind of timeout. So you can see this has kind of a more robust uh, industrial, there's extra functionality. Yeah? This is made for real uh, message passing in real, uh, real world systems, okay? So I have to tell you about the semantics of receive. So this is different from port objects. Huh? So a port object, you have a stream, and you receive the messages in the stream one after the other. Punk, punk, punk. And you cannot skip a message. Huh? You have to handle the first one, second, third, fourth. Receive is not like that. Okay. So how does it work? Well, if the mailbox is empty, it blocks. If the mailbox is not empty, 
it looks at the first message in the box and tries patterns to see whether there's a matching pattern. If it finds one, it takes the message. Okay? If no pattern matches, it waits for the next message. Okay? Unmatched messages, they stay in the middle box. Okay? Now, the point also is messages can be removed out of order. If I have two messages in the mailbox, and if the first message does not match, then it will try the second message. And if the second message matches, it takes it out. But the first message stays. So it's really like a mailbox. Huh? I'm waiting for mail. Let's say I'm, I ordered uh, a book, okay? And I go into my mailbox, and I see a bunch of things. I see a package, but I see other things. I take the book, I forget, I let the rest stay in the box. Huh? So Erlang works like that. Huh? Or I'm waiting for uh, a message from the tax authority, so I sent my tax form and I need to get a, a reply back. Uh, but there's other mails in there. Huh? There's maybe uh, advertisements, whatever. I forget about those, I, take, I see the one that I want and I take it out. So airline mailboxes work like that, okay? That means I can have different parts of a process handling different kinds of messages. You see, maybe different kinds of messages are arriving, and this part handles uh, the, the compute messages, and the other part handles, for example, the, the administration messages for routing or something, yeah? So you can actually modularize. So this is actually a very nice way of doing things. But it's more complicated than port objects. Huh? The semantics of this is actually, if you want to formalize it, it's not so simple. It's actually in the book. Huh? If you want to look at the actual formal semantics of this, you can find it in chapter 5. Huh? OK, so that's how the receive works. OK, and, and so far, so far, we have standard, we have standard multi-agent. From now on, the things I'm going to say now later, airline goes beyond that. It has many new ideas compared to what we saw to help you do real, robust multi-agent programs. Okay? So let me make a small break now, and so the real new stuff of airline will come after the break. Okay? Now we're going to see some of the more uh, special concepts in Erlang. That's something we didn't see before for doing real big uh, multi-agent systems. So one idea in Erlang is called process registering. When you make a process, when you spawn a process as a PI process ID, okay, but what if the process crashes and you replace it, you, you restart again? Then you have another process with another process ID, okay? So the process ID is changed because of the crash. To get around this, airline lets you register a process with a name, which is actually an atom. It's a constant. So it's like a global name, like a, a web server or something. Huh? With this, you can keep the interface the same, unchanged even if underneath processes are crashing and replaced, restarted, or whatever, the interface on top is the same, so you don't see any difference. You have this function called register that takes a process ID and gives it the name Adam. You can also remove the registration. When a process crashes, you can actually register the new process to uh, the new process to the same name as before, okay? And you can look, you can say, for example, from the name, you can find out which process is registered to it, okay? You can also take it, find a list of all the registered processes. So this is an interface, a more high-level interface on top of the regular processes. Huh? It's kind of a, a, a database of global visible processes. So not all processes, we have hundreds of them. I'm only going to register like the, the ones that I really want that people know and they can send messages to. 
Okay, so that's process registering. And now I want to talk for more support for fault tolerance. Erlang has a lot of support for applications that keep running if there are errors. And the basic idea is called process linking. Okay, linking is a primitive thing where you connect two processes together. You connect them, so PID1 can call link PID2. It can be done on each side, but it's symmetrical, okay? It's bidirectional. Either one can make the link, but once you have the link, it's symmetrical, bidirectional. So the two processes have this special connection, the link. So normally, the link doesn't do anything. When the process runs normally, the link is just, not, is just sitting there. But when the process terminates, then the link is important. So the link, when one of the process terminates, then it sends a signal to all the linked processes, okay? They will all get a signal. Now, process can terminate for many reasons. It can terminate normally, huh? it just terminates, but it can also crash, it can have runtime error. Because of software error, maybe you divide by zero, whatever, or, or it can be uh, because the process uh, is running on a node on another machine, the machine crashes. There's many reasons why processes can crash. Software crash, hardware crash, okay? All of this is seen by linking. So when the process terminates normally, then the other processes, they receive this message called normal. That means everything is okay. But when there's a runtime error, they receive a tuple. So this is a tuple with two arguments, huh? the reason, and then actually information about what's on the stack. So you get some information, okay? And this is transitive. So if you have many processes, so I think I have a little bit of space for making a diagram here, okay? So if all these processes are linked together, Let's say this is a process and this is a link. If this one crashes, okay, then there's an exit reason signal. And this creates a message in all the linked processes, okay? And this is transitive. That means all of the linked processes will get the message. They will all get it. So linking, you create a set of processes, okay? Okay, so what happens? What happens when I get this message? Okay, so let me make now another little diagram. So let's say I have three processes that are linked together. Okay, and this one crashes. So this is P1, P2, P3. Okay, and P1 crashes. Then by default, what happens? is, well, this one crashes, by default, the message will cause the others to terminate. So we assume that they're actually all working together, okay? So the idea is that when P1 crashes, that P2 and P3 cannot continue. They're like collaborating. Maybe they're implementing database or some telephone connection or something. And if P1 crashes, then P2 and P3 they can't work anymore. So by default is that both of these also will terminate. So by default is they will all terminate. The whole thing terminates. So you can see airline likes crashes. Huh? If, if one process crashes, it's not like P2 will try to continue. Airline has the opposite view. If P1 crashes, it forces the others to crash. You see how that, that might seem kind of weird, huh? Maybe, why not just let P2 try to fix things? No, no, no. That's, from Erlang's point of view, that's wrong. The best way is to cause everybody to crash. So how is the problem fixed? Well, someone else will fix it. 
It's not the processes actually working together that will fix it. It's someone else, okay? So by default, they will all crash, okay? And now you can, op you can build on top of that. You can have another process, P4, with a special, okay, with a special, a special flag called trap exit. So P4 will not crash. P4 will get a message, okay? So the exit signal, so P1, P2, P3 all crash when P1 crashes. But P4 does not. It has a special bit, a flag called trap exit. And P4 will get a message giving the reason for the crash, okay? It will get a message giving the reason. And that, with that, we can build supervisors. So the idea is that P4 is actually a special guy who is observing P1, P2, P3. So P1, P2, P3 are actually doing the work. But P4 is not actually part of that. P4 is not doing the work. The only reason for P4 is to observe the crashes. And when, this, when there's a problem here and there's a crash, then we force all of these three to crash, and then P4 will get a message, because it has a trap exit. So this is not the default. You have to set it specifically, yeah? Trap exit. So this, with this, we implement the whole, the whole supervision mechanism for Erlang. So Erlang has a thing called supervisor trees, which allows you to build extremely robust applications where you have some processes are actually observing the others. And when, when they see a crash, they do something to fix it, okay? So P4 will be a higher level in the supervisor. So this is implemented using linking and trap exit, okay? So you can see this is a simple mechanism, huh? This simple mechanism and things are built on top of this, okay? So we'll see supervisor trees later, but they, you have to imagine they're built on top of this basic linking mechanism, okay? So process linking, okay? So here's a little piece of code. I start, I create a process. So start will actually return the process ID. I have here go. So this is actually the, the process I create. This one, let's say it sets trap exit to true, and then it does a loop. So this loop will receive messages, and it will maybe do other things in recursive call, but it has this pattern. Exit, so exit is constant, then process ID and the reason. So this is a supervisor process, okay? This one will get a message from all the linked processes, okay? So, and then you can, you can manage this, huh? So if a process throws an exception, all the linked processes get the exit signal, okay? And then you can manage this. You can, you can arrange to send exit signal without terminating, or you can send an unstoppable exit. So there's some management operation. But the basic idea is that you have a process here which is observing the other one and receives this exit signal, okay? So that's linking. So linking is bidirectional. There's also uh, an asymmetric version of it. This is called monitoring in airline, which is kind of an unfortunate name because it has nothing to do with monitors in uh, shared state concurrency. In shared state concurrency, there's a thing called monitors, but airline monitoring has nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, if, for example, if you have a client server and the server crashes, well, the clients, we don't have any more purpose. So the whole cloud of clients have to crash. But if the client crashes, we do not want to kill the server because they have other clients. So inside a big application, you can have many servers, okay? A server is like a, 
a pattern. Uh, you have many servers providing some functionality. If the server crashes, then all the clients have to crash because they cannot continue. But if a client crashes, we don't want to kill the server. So it's asymmetric, you see? So in some cases, the linking has to be asymmetric. In some cases, one of them is more important, like the server, than the others. So in Airlight, this is called monitor. So it's like linking, but it's, it's only going in one direction, okay? So the example, typical example for that is a client server. Okay, so that's that's the basic concept. Huh? And earlier you have linking, and then you have the monitor version, the asymmetric version, and then you have the supervisor, which is using this trap exit flag. Huh? And the whole thing is transitive. So these are the basic ideas. Huh? So you have a, a set of processes linked together. Maybe it's asymmetric, and some of them are special. They're not going to crash, but they will get a message. So these are used for the supervisor. Okay, so that's how Erlang builds patterns. But of course, the programmer usually doesn't use all this. The programmer will use patterns. So we're going to see that later. Okay. Another thing for Erlang is distributed systems. Let's say I have a program running on more than one computer. So the two processes can be both running on this machine, but maybe I have one airline piece of the application here, and another one on another computer, another one over there, another one over there. So the system is distributed, okay? So it consists of many airline runtimes, and these are called nodes. So many instances of the airline virtual machine, in fact. Huh? And they're all talking to each other. So this is actually transparent. When I do a send, when I do a PID, I send a message, I actually don't know whether the process is on the same computer as me, the same node, or on another one. It's completely transparent. So Erlangers makes distributed programming very easy. And you can see that this is very good together with the no sharing. When I send a message, the message is copied. So this is very reasonable when I have a distributed system. It's very hard to have pointers across uh, nodes. Huh? Pointers from one machine to another, like a language pointer, is very hard. Because the pointer is pointing to a piece of memory. But if it's on another machine, then you can't just point to that. Huh? It's much harder. But in airline, you don't have pointers. It's no sharing. So when, when I send a message to a process, it's always a copy. So this process could be on another machine, okay? It's all transparent. Message passing between processes at different nodes, including links and monitors, is transparent. That means the code is the same. You don't see any difference. So that means building a distributed system in Erlang is very easy. And you can create uh, processes on other nodes. So there's a version of the spawn where you can actually create a process on another node. Okay. Okay. So and then there's some rules for, for using it. Okay. When you have registered names, they are local uh, to one node. When you send messages to a registered name, you have to also specify the node. It's on. Okay, that's one thing. And the first time you use the name of the node, the system makes a, an attempt to connection. Okay, so this connection is done transparently, and it's transitive. That means if I send a message to one node, and then it sends a message to a third node, the system tries to make connections between all nodes. So it tries to make what's called a fully connected mesh. That means all the nodes are connected to each other. Now this is not really scalable for huge numbers. It's uh, because you have n squared. It's proportional to n squared. Huh? But for distributed systems with 
like small number of nodes, like running on a cluster, local layer network, this is fine. But if you have very big airline systems, you have to do it more scalable way. But by default, it's trying to connect all the nodes together. Okay, so that's another thing for airline that it's allowing you to build distributed systems. Okay. But that's not all. There's more in airline. One of the things, very special things for airline, is that you can make applications that never stop. And when I say never, I mean really never, even when you update the software. Uh, usually you're used to, when you update an application, you have to restart the application. Huh? Seems obvious, right? Well, for critical applications, that's not possible. So there is, for example, I can give you an industrial example of this. There is a database, an industrial database. This is a cloud database called RIA. Okay. Now, this one is written in Erlang, and it's written to never stop. It never stops. That means even when you update the software, like fixing bugs or adding new features, it does not stop. And I can show you one application where it's being used. So if you look at in Denmark, so the country of Denmark, you have a national medical database. Okay? So other countries have similar, but this one I know one, I know. So in Denmark, so it's had billions of, it's a small country, but still millions of people. Uh, smaller than Belgium, but still, still not that small. There is a national medical database. So patients have an account, doctors have accounts on this, pharmacies have accounts on this, and uh, hospitals have accounts on this. So when I go to the doctor, he makes a prescription, it goes into this database. When I go to the pharmacy, the description is coming from the database. And I can also connect as a patient and see my prescriptions. So the doctor can see if I have other prescriptions. Okay. So this database, it would be very bad if it would go down. Okay. If it would crash. Uh, it might actually be life critical. Maybe I need to see right away, I have to give a medication to a patient, and I need to see right away, like in a couple minutes, if there's any problem. This database is written using React, which is implemented in Erlang, using the mechanisms I will show. It's using this dynamic code updating mechanism that allows applications to keep running even when I'm updating the software. So you see, Erlang is very serious about making robust software. Right? It's not just crashing software, but it's also updates are have to be handled. Updates are normal things. It's happening quite normally. Okay. So Erlang has several mechanisms for this. Okay. So here, here is one. Okay. Here is one, the basic mechanism here. So in a real time system, we like to change the code, update without stuff. Okay, so some systems are never supposed to be stopped. So here's another example. Satellite control system developed by NASA, X2000. In a monolithic system like Java, it's very hard, yeah? Um, I was wondering, um, how do you handle um, database migration to extend it to the ah. Because you can have two versions of this. Absolutely. So, so it's actually, how do you handle database migration? In React, it's the, I can give you the, just the basic idea. In React, you have the database is replicated for fault tolerance. And the way, if you update, let's say you change the format of the database. So that's usually not so, so easy thing. So the way you do that is you change the format in just a subset of the nodes. And then you, at some point in time, both versions exist at the same time, okay? And, and the, ver the old version will slowly will be transformed into the new version. So during a certain time, the system will handle both versions. 
So actually, React has a whole uh, procedure for handling this. It's not so simple, okay? Database migration. So the programmers, they have to follow some very strict rules for this to make it work. But the way it works is that the migration, the migration takes time. And during this time, the system has to keep running. Because that's the problem. It can be very long, uh, the migration. So you let the, the two versions exist simultaneously, and nodes will, one after the other, they will transform to the new version. And once all the old versions are disappeared, then the system goes back into a state where you have only one version. Okay. So, in fact, you're, in airline, you only can have two versions of the code. Not three, never three, two most. Otherwise, it's too complicated. So in database migration, if you want to do two migrations, you have to do first one and then the other one. Normally, that's okay, because you don't do them so often, huh? these migrations. Okay, so in Erlang, each module can have two versions of the code. So the database migration, if you change the format of a database, you're changing the code too. Huh? The data changes, but the code is changing. So the way that Erlang does it is each module is allowed, the same module the same, is allowed to have two versions. Okay, all new processes will be linked to the latest version if you create a new process. But a running process, a running process normally will continue with the old version until it terminates. So that's how you that's how you implement the migration. Okay. Okay. So I can show you a little bit then the uh, processes uh, when they they can actually choose also to use the old or the new code. Okay. But it's important to understand that you have maximum two versions. So this, the, the virtual machine is doing some work for this, huh? Because the same source code corresponds to two compiled versions, huh? So here is uh, sort of how the code would look. So here I have a module M. I receive a message. I have a loop. So the way that servers work is they have recursive loops, okay? I get a message, and then I do a, a loop to get more messages. So this is actually the server. And each iteration, it receives a message, it does some work, okay? And it does a recursive call, okay? Now, depending on how you write this recursive call, you can keep using the old version by doing loop, or you can use the new version by doing module colon loop. So the programmer can choose to use the old or the new version. <coughs> okay, so this is the mechanism, and the system that in the implementation supports two versions. So this is what uh, you handle, for example, upgrading of applications, database migration. So systems like React, they use this, this is the basic mechanism. Of course, you have to use it in a good way, huh? You have to use it in a good way, because you can do buggy with this, huh? But if you do it in a good way, this lets you do migration without stopping the application, okay? So this is very important for real critical applications, okay? Is that kind of answering? So I'm only giving you an introduction to this, huh? If you really want to see how it's really work, do it, then you have to look at other documents. But this gives you the idea. You can see that the airline uh, system is very serious about making things robust. Huh? It's doing it, and it's very simple. You see, it's actually a simple mechanism. Airline does tries very hard to make the mechanism as simple as possible. Okay, and I want to talk a little bit about that now. Uh, I want to talk about how Erlang does programming patterns in some of the tools. So Erlang invented a kind of approach. It's called Erlang philosophy, okay? So the, the team that originally designed Erlang in the late 80s, so the main, one of the main designers is Joe Armstrong, okay? Actually, I know Joe, he's a very interesting guy. Unfortunately, he, he died two years ago, okay? But this was done in 19, around 19, eight, late 80s. 
So you can actually see Joe Armstrong's, he did a PhD. It's very funny. He did this like around 1990, and he was not doing a PhD. He was working in Ericsson. They had a team of people, and they built this thing. And they didn't care. They built this nice thing, airline system, okay? And then in the years 2000, Joe, he said, well, maybe I want to get a PhD. So he basically wrote down everything he did, and that was his PhD. Uh, so, so the industry guy, he went and he said, ah, I'd like to have a PhD. So everything he did at Ericsson, he then made it. Okay. So they actually made some very interesting principles that are going against some of the folklore of building robust systems. Okay. So I want to show you this philosophy because it's actually a very good philosophy. And the proof is that airline works. Okay, it works. So if you want to build robust software in Java, you should use the same principles. Huh? So the principles are, first of all, you cannot eliminate errors. You cannot write correct software. So the basic principle is that all software is buggy. Okay, And you cannot fix it. You can reduce a little bit the number of bugs. So people trying to make completely correct software, that's wrong. You cannot. That's the first principle. All software is buggy, and you can have both hardware and software errors. Huh? So handle so hardware crashes, like you can have a cosmic ray going into your system, and this happens in real critical systems, huh? That causes a bit to flip and you have an error. Or software errors. You cannot get rid of them. That's the first principle. Okay? The second principle is that you need units of failure, isolation. You need, if one piece of the software has a mistake, you need it to be isolated from others. You need something like strong isolation, uh, where if one piece crashes, the other does not. That's why the processes do not share in error. Okay? Third principle is that if there's a bug, you, you crash right away. Okay? Uh, either you run correctly, or if there's a problem, you immediately crash. You don't try to keep going. Huh? If there's an error, fail fast. You stop quickly. And then you should detect the failure. So this is the linking. Okay? And then there's no shared state. So this is a consequence of strong isolation. Huh? The components will send messages, but there's no sharing. Okay? To get into this, Mindset, Erlang has some slogans. So the most famous Erlang slogan is, let it crash. If you cannot do your job, crash. Let it crash. That means if something goes wrong, you force the program to crash. So the linking, it forces everybody to crash, right? If one node goes wrong. Instead of trying to fix things, which is very complicated, just map all the problems to one simple state, crashed. So if, if, if part of your system starts to go wrong, don't try to fix the inside there. Make the whole thing crash. Let it crash. Okay? And then some other process will fix things. Okay? You cannot fix things inside the same software that's doing the work. Someone else has to fix. This is very reasonable. Huh? If I have a problem like appendicitis, okay, I need to go to a surgeon. I'm not going to operate myself, okay? I'm, the surgeon is going to operate on me. There's actually famous stories related to this. There was some uh, Soviet um, research center in Antarctica, and the, there was a doctor there and he had appendicitis. There was no other surgeon. So the guy was, uh, this is a famous thing, very badass, eh? Baleza. <laughs> he actually operated on himself. Other people had, there was a mirror, and, and, and so he was operating on himself to fix his appendix. It's pretty, I do not recommend this. Okay? <laughs> so, so it can be done, but, but I, and, and he actually survived. But appendicitis is not, very hard, but still, he has to cut open inside his own appendix and remove it and everything up. Huh? 
So usually that's very not that's not the way to do duh. So for software, it's the same. If a software, a piece of software has a problem, then that piece of software should not try to fix it. Okay. It should just crash. Okay? Uh, trying to solve them in the process makes things complicated. So you don't do that. You have to have another piece of software which is observing you, and that one fixes things. Okay? So that is the airline philosophy, and this works very well. So whenever there's a problem on a piece of software, just crash, and there's someone else who can fix it. So you can say, do not program defensively. You know there's this thing called defensive programming, where you add checks everywhere. Checks, 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 checks. Are the pipes good? Is the structure good? Everything is good. This makes the program complicated, okay? What do you do when a check fails? Ooh, it's hard, not easy to know. And anyway, you cannot check all errors, huh? Some errors will still happen. So this is wrong in the airline point of view. Do not do defensive programming. Do not put checks. If there's a problem, just crash. If any time you see a problem, just terminate, just crash, okay? So just, that's actually very simple to do, and it means the code is much simpler if you do this, huh? This actually causes airline code to be simple. So this philosophy proves that it's a good way of doing things, okay? Okay, so what I'm going to show you now, and also next week, I'm going to show you how airline does this. You see, you saw already one piece, uh, the linking. You have many processes linked together, one of them crashes, they all crash. This is let it crash, huh? And then you have another one, which is linked with track exit. And this one does not crash, but it can see them crash, okay? And that is this second principle. The second, this guy will observe the crash process, and it does something. Maybe it's the fix is easy. Maybe the fix is just restarts. Huh? Actually, very often, it's, uh, that will fix things, because most of these errors are temporary occurrences. But maybe it's more complicated. And no, do not program defensively. That means the code is simple, not complicated code. Okay? So this is really, this philosophy is really very good. And in fact, all systems should do this. Some systems make this very hard. Huh? This is very hard to do in Java because the program is monolithic. The one process is one block of code. You cannot have a piece of it crash. The whole thing crashes. So Java is not designed for this, okay? But Erlang is designed for this, okay? So Erlang, when you use it, there's a library called OTP, it's not Open Telecom Platform. So when you install Erlang, you have a whole bunch of things that are predefined called OTP. And you have a couple of concepts in there. So a release, an application, so this is a single application inside the release, a behavior, so this is like a concurrency pattern, and a worker, this is a part of a behavior. So let me talk first about behavior. So for example, this could be a client server. Client server is a typical kind of behavior. And what happens when clients crash? What happens when servers crashes? crash? Uh, what happens when you want to update the server? All of that is part of the behavior. And all of that is handled by OTP. So you don't have to write any code for that. So another behavior is supervisor, where you have a tree. A tree, so the node in the root is observing the sub parts. Okay? It monitors the other behaviors. So it's part of behavior. So the supervisor is looking at the client server, and if there's a problem with the client server, the supervisor will do something to fix it. Maybe it just restarts, or maybe it, it does update software, and there's different things you can do. But all of that is built into the airline library. So the programmer does not have to write code for that. It's automatic. All you have to do is write the code for 
the actual function you want to do. Okay? All of the management of concurrency and fault tolerance is done automatically by Erlang. And that's very nice. Okay? That means writing these robust applications is very easy in Erlang. You don't have to do so much work. So on top of behavior, you have application. So an application can have multiple behaviors. Eh? It's doing something. It could be telecommunication. So Hera, for example, is an example of this. Okay. On top of that, you have the actual release. So that means you can have versions of an application. And you can go from one version to the next version. So a release. Okay. This is including the upgrading. So there's support for upgrading without stopping. Okay. So there's a lot of there's support for this structure. So you don't have to write the code. Erlang will help you. Okay. So behaviors is an invention of Erlang. The behavior, it's like a pattern, it's like a concurrency pattern, and it does all the hard work for you. It abstracts concurrency and fault tolerance. So let's say I want to build a robust concurrent fault tolerant server. That's not so easy. And I want to do up, up, automatic updating and everything. Erlen has done it for you. Okay. So if you look at programs, there's always hard pieces, difficult and easy pieces. Okay. The difficult modules are written by expert programmers. So the actual behavior is written by expert Erlang programmers, and it's completely good, okay? So regular programmers, and that's us, uh, even me, is, is doing just the easy modules. So concurrency and fault tolerance are very hard. Eh? I think you agree that it's hard. Eh? And whenever you try to build, and probably you have not so much experience with that already in applications. Uh? People kind of, oof, it's hard. But it's important in real life. So the behaviors will hide all the hard bits. Okay? These behaviors, they are parts of the Erlang library that you can use. Okay? And then you can actually look at the system documentation. So for example, uh, version 10.7, March 15, 2020, it has all the behaviors. But let me sh tell you what are the standard behaviors in Erlang. So basically, there are uh, five standard behaviors. And for most applications, this does most what you want. You have the generic server. This allows building client server with registration, starting, stopping, timeouts, state, synchronous, asynchronous error. It's all handled by the behavior. So that's, servers are very easy in Erlang. Also, event handlers. This is also an important thing. Like logging, things happen. You have to keep track of events okay, in time, like loggers. So there's a behavior for that. And then the actual functionality, the code of the application, that's actually a generic finite state machine. Applications can be modeled as finite state machines, so they have state transition. This is doing the work on the code of the application. So this also is a behavior. You can actually model your application, then you can update it, you can start it, stop it, migrate it, whatever. Huh? Generic finite state machine. And then application is a component that combines many things and can be started and stopped as a single unit. So it groups together many things and can be reused. And final one is the supervisor. This is the one for handling the fault tolerance, implementing the hierarchy where you have observers. Okay. So these five behaviors are standard in Erlang OTP, and it means that actually writing these robust applications in Erlang is very easy, because most of the hard work is done inside there. Okay. So, uh, so Erlang is actually a really nice system, and it's, it, it's um, it's used a lot in many applications, but usually the, the companies don't say there is an airliner. It's not worth it for the marketing, but it helps them build the robust thing, okay? So most of the complexity of each concept is hidden. 
So concurrency, fault tolerance, but also management, like starting, stopping, updating. It's very simple in the behaviors, okay? So let me just say a little bit more. So next week, I'm going to show you the real the code for two behaviors, the server and the supervisors. So we're going to see real code, and I'll show you kind of how it works. Of course, in this course, it's not a course on Erlang. Huh? You have two lab sessions on Erlang, and you'll have two lectures this week and next week on Erlang. So you won't become total experts on Erlang, but at least you have some good idea of what Erlang can do. And it's very important to know these concepts because they're useful everywhere, okay? So let me just say one more th uh, thing, a few th things, and then we're done for today. So Erlang has supervisor trees for handling crashes. But supervisor tree is not enough. You need a second thing, which is called stable storage, like a disk. Huh? If you have a crash and you restart, uh, if there's no stable storage, you have no, you don't know how to restart, okay? So the supervisor is not enough. You need two pillars. You need stable storage and supervisor trees. So Erlang provides three levels, simple and more sophisticated ones. So the ETS is just storing terms, Erlang terms. You don't have to worry about translating, whatever. Anything you want to store in Erlang, you can store it, okay? But it's only using on, uh, it's only in memory. So this one works when you have a process that crashes, but the virtual machine is still running, okay? I have a virtual machine with many processes. If some of these crash, I can restart these processes, but the virtual machine did not crash. Then you can use ETS. But if the virtual machine crashes, you need to restart the virtual machine, then you can use disk-based ETS. So the difference is, of course, it's a little bit slower because it's using disk, okay? So this one, you can use it for that. Huh? Sorry, no, the disk also is using single, sorry, virtual machine, but it's, uh, it actually can help when the virtual machine itself is rebooting. It's not for multiple, right? it's for single virtual machine. And then you have a more complicated one called Manesia. So this is a full transactional database built on top of ETS and VTS. So this one is for its distribution replication. So this is very flexible, but it's slower. Huh? So in many applications, it's enough to use ETS, okay? The simple versions, or you have a full one. So this gives you the stable storage together with supervised trees you can build extremely robust, okay? And then there's one mile more final thing I have to say, and then we're done for today. Testing. So, of course, Erlang does not remove the need for testing. Any system that is not tested does not work, okay? That's true also for Erlang. Erlang is not magic, okay? It doesn't solve that. You have to do testing. So Erlang provides testing framework, so you can test. If you have a very big, robust, concurrent fault tolerant thing, you have to test it. You have to do what's called fault, in fault injection, okay? You have to force things to crash and see whether your system is running, okay? So you have unit testing, so you know you've already done unit testing, right? I guess, huh? So you have that. Unit testing, but more than unit testing, you have to allow, you have to be able to test bigger parts of your system. So you have this thing called common test, okay? Uh, this allows uh, running tests in parallel. So you have race conditions in concurrent systems you can test for. You can test sweeps for dependencies. You can also do fault injection, force things to terminate, okay? And finally, you have this really interesting tool called Dialyzer. So this is actually kind of a, a, a verification tool that works really well, even though it's dynamically typed and concurrent. So this is actually a kind of very nice tool, okay? Okay, so let me stop here for today.
So next time, I want to see two things. I want to show you some of the patterns, like generic server, but I'm also going to show you, uh, I'm going to give you a talk made by a game company. I think it was Demonware or something that makes games. And they were using Erlang, okay? In real, real games. So gaming is a very demanding area, okay? Gaming is very hard. Some of you might be gamers. But implementing the games is very hard. So I'm going to show you some experience from real companies that are using Erlang for games. And I'll also show you how to do some labs. Okay. So that's where we end today.